the Wellness Hour. An in-depth discussion with today's top physicians and medical leaders. And now, your host, Randy Alvarez. You are watching The Wellness Hour, the leader in medical news and information. I'm Randy Alvarez. We're talking about the eyes today. If you're not happy with the way you are aging in and around your eyes, you have to hear what my first guest has to say. He is an oculoplastic surgeon, Dr. Weiss. Dr. Weiss, welcome to the program. Well, thanks for inviting me, Randy. Okay, before getting into today's topic, uh, tell me a little bit about your center. And I guess you're one of the first centers to just focus on the eyes, in and around the eyes. But as an oculoplastic surgeon, did I say that right, by the way? Yes. What are the different procedures you do, and who's your typical patient? Well, it's a little bit more than just the eyes. It's the region of the face around the eye. Okay. Everything that I've become an expert in is because of its relation to the eyes. So it's the eyebrow, endoscopic brow lifts, upper eyelid surgery, droopy eyelids, which is a little bit different than upper eyelid surgery, lower eyelids where they have baggy eyes and saggy eyes, even laser skin resurfacing around the face. I've become a Botox expert because that happens to be the best way to improve the appearance of certain conditions around the eyes. Okay. Fillers, natural fillers, um, Juvederm, facial fillers, things like that. All around the eyes, that's yes. all you do. That's me. And uh, you know, one of the things I should mention, and by the way, if they're just tuning in, we're talking about eyes today, uh, oculoplastic surgeon, and, and I wanna get into what that actually means and what your specialized training is, but the photos that uh, you're about to show, mm -hmm. so I, people need to stick around. We'll get to those, by the okay. way. Okay. These, and I'm trying not to endorse you. People need to know that I just met you today that I'm not siding with you here, but those are some of the most dramatic photos I've ever seen. Well, thank you. So this is gonna be good, okay. So first, oculoplastic surgery. Ophthalmologist, okay. is that correct? Yes. And then tell me about this okay. other Oculoplastic specialty. surgery has only been in existence for about 40 years now. It's a combination between ophthalmology and plastic surgeries because there are special techniques that have to be used around the eyes in reconstructive and cosmetic surgery because after all, the eyes are an organ that we all care about and they have to be protected in a certain way. Okay. The eyelids have to blink, and protect the eye, lubricate the eye, and if they're in a the wrong position or a malposition, and they're just special techniques to protect the eye. So that's where oculoplastic surgery came from. You know, back to your question, uh, there's no typical patient, but in oculoplastic surgery, being in Newport Beach, my, my practice is generally gravitated toward the cosmetic side. So I would say my typical patient is someone who wants to look a little and feel a little bit better about themselves, particularly when it relates to the eye. So people who maybe can't keep the eyelids open or have a lot of fullness on their eyelids. A lot of people have baggy eye lower lids and they have uh, dark circles under the eyes. It makes them look tired. So we like to try to make people look more relaxed and alert. And you get referrals from some plastic surgeons, other guys. I do, I Is that do. Right? I see, well, we're the experts in the eyelids and if there's any, ever any complicated procedure or delicate procedure that has to be done around the eyes, it finds its way to an oculoplastic surgeon. All right, now you're known all over the world. I mean, Nelson Mandela, went to you. You yes, took care of big his honor. eyes. That was a big honor. How does that happen, by the way? Well, I happen to be well known at what I do in oculoplastic surgery, and in this particular problem that he had, I happened to have some experience. It was a very demanding, a little technical problem that... Could you get him to come on this show, by the way, and talk about it? <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> you know, you could get him to come on the show. I doubt and, it. And you see, so you have a lot of Hollywood, well-known people, but you have regular people yes. that are coming in. So bags are in the eyes, droopy eyelids, Mm -hmm. Brows. Well, we do endoscopic brow lifts, upper eyelid surgery, lower eyelid surgery. Sometimes people come in with tumors around the eye and they that require right? special techniques because, again, the eyes are something we have to protect. We all care about our eyes. In fact, the most feared condition is blindness in most surveys. So because of that, we use special techniques so that whatever we do around the eyes, it leaves you being able to see and having comfortable eyes. Okay, so on to today's topic. Uh, first off, with the eyes, how important do you think the eyes are when it comes to the aging process? Well, look at us now. We're looking at each other. We're looking at each other's eyes. We're okay, not looking at okay. each other's chests. So the eyes are the first thing that people notice about us. And if they look tired, and they actually are the first part of the face that gets wrinkled. In fact, the people that come in to see me, their cheeks look great, but their eyelids show the signs of aging. All right. So okay. the first thing that really people notice about themselves when they look in the mirror and they start to get my age is they get they, they notice the wrinkles around their eyes. So the eyes are the first signs of aging, but it also is, are the first signs of people looking tired, maybe not feeling tired. A common complaint I get is that a person comes in and says, you know, my, my coworker or my sister says I look so tired, but I'm not tired, I got a great night's right? sleep. Okay. It's because of the wrinkles and the bags and the shadows around the eyes. And that's now, is a that simple a tricky thing to take area, care of. by the way? Is that a tough area under the eyes? Because I know a lot of plastic guys, they don't like to touch under the eyes. Well, it's a delicate area to work on, 
but I think that if you have the experience to work on it, it's a very safe procedure. How often do you do these things that we're talking about today? Just about every day. Every day. Mm -hmm. Because I know I guys, and I always tell, you know, people, look, I don't endorse people. People will email us, who do you go to? I say, go to a specialist. Mm -hmm. That's always my response. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, I mean, the fact that, what, 25 years you've been in Newport mm -hmm. Beach? Restricting your practice to eyes? Yes. How much better are you now than you were 10 years ago, 15 years ago? Well, you know, practice makes perfect, Randy. And I think that I've gotten a lot of practice. And by the way, beforehand, I think I misspoke. I said I do it every day. I don't do it on Fridays. Because <laughs> I'd like to see the patient personally the next day. So I make sure that the surgery days are Monday through Thursday. And you're a hands-on guy. You say it's it's kind of like I, I can't help myself labeling you like a perfectionist, but like almost obsessive about. I can't you, help. you say you don't have RNs doing things. I don't delegate you too like many things. I see the patient at the uh, at the consultation beforehand. I do all the surgery myself. I see the patient on the first day. I even take out the stitches myself. I, in fact, I call my every patient the next night that night to make sure they're all tucked away and feeling good about themselves. Okay. Now, uh, and by the way, when should somebody do something about their eyes? You know, or get I, think a consult. That, I think that somebody should do something when they have, when they look in the mirror and it's something, a lot of people come in and say, well, you know, what do I need, Dr. Weiss? And I say, you know, I, like, I, I just try to turn the mirror around and ask them, what are you concerned about? Because what I don't do want, they always say every time? Well, I don't want people to do surgery because I'm concerned about something. I want them to do surgery about because they're concerned about something. I like to solve problems, not create them. So when someone comes, when someone comes to my office and asks that question, I certainly don't don't want to point out things that never occurred to them and have them leave my office feeling worse than they did. I'm in the process, I'm in the business of making people feel better about themselves, not pointing out things about themselves. You know, one of the things you said, which I like, you know, we're talking in our green room and you said uh, that, I, it, it, that you're amazed, I'm paraphrasing, uh, they're all smiles after the procedure's done, yeah. just a couple of days later. One of the big senses of Because it sounds like an exaggeration a little bit. Well, it's not really, you know, one of the big senses of satisfaction that I have, I must say, to patients, you've made my day a half a dozen times a day. And that's for two reasons. One is from the satisfaction I get from doing a perfect job, but it's also from the sense of happiness that I sense from these patients. Patients come in on the first day and they just have a smile from ear to ear. And it makes me happy and it's infectious. It makes the whole the office happy. Okay, then we're talking about above the eye, the brows, Well, under really, the whatever eye. procedure they get, all the procedures that I do, I'm lucky. The specialty that I work in, a lot of these procedures can be performed under local anesthesia. You don't have to, so you don't have to go to the hospital. Okay. And they're very fast recovering procedures. So a patient can come in fairly quickly and feel very good about themselves and already see the result. Many times, even before they go home, I, in fact, every patient that I operate on, I grab the mirror afterwards before they leave the operating table and I hold it up to them. And even then, they're going to have a big smile on their face. And we're going to show these photos in just a second, what, you know, what, what you're doing. But one of the things that I don't hear from doctors, you, you said perfect. You want to make it perfect. Well, I'm kind of kind elaborate of, on that. I'm kind of a perfectionist, and um, in the one sense, I don't delegate to someone else to do any any of the what jobs in my office. What does that mean? Perfect. I mean, what's the perfect? The perfect thing is to make somebody natural. I, the the thing that we appreciate most with cosmetic surgery is a natural look, and what that really means is, among other things, the most important thing is symmetry. So if we can get somebody symmetric. They'll look very, very natural if you don't alter the tissues too much or pull things. But the most important thing in making someone look natural is making them look completely symmetric. So I have a special operating table that sits you to an upright position. You mean one eye matching the other eye? Yes. Okay. And it, when I'm done all my work and I, with all my special techniques and sutures and everything. You got some secrets, by the way. Despite all, <laughs> despite all the special sauce and everything, at the end of the procedure, when they're sutured up, we sit them up on the special operating table that I have and I walk around. And I'll look at them. Interesting. And if it's not exactly perfect, then I'll sit them back down. I'll take out the stitches and just take out a little bit of a little bit. Like on a blepharoplasty. On a blepharoplasty. Just like a little bit of eye. skin. And then close it up again. And you know, Is that unheard it of, makes by the a way? big difference. And it makes me more satisfied when I leave the operating room. Is that unheard of, by the way? Giving me the inside scoop. I mean, most guys that would sit them up and up take and a look. Some people don't feel that you can tell at the time of surgery, but there are certain techniques that I use to be able to tell. Okay. One of them is using a, a substance in the local injection that diffuses very rapidly so that it doesn't cause any distortion and it allows me to be able to tell during surgery. And also, I, the way that I operate, the techniques that I use don't create much bruising, if, if any. So if there's no bruising and the, and the local anesthetic is diffused, I could tell exactly what it's gonna look like so that when a patient sits up, if there's a little bit of a difference, I'd like to take care of it before you leave the operating room. I don't like to hope that it gets better later. 
I like to take care of it when we finish. And these finish. people, by the way, because I saw your videos, and they're on your website, mm -hmm. two days later, no bruising. Not in every For, case, but in many cases. But, I mean, it, it can happen. Yes. Okay, now, let's, let's take a look at some of your photos. Well, I don't know how many of these we'll be able to get in, but okay. I brought a representative sample of people of different ages, men and women, um, some Asians, some on darker complexions, lighter complexions, and various different procedures on the upper lid, the brow, and the lower lid. Okay, here's a woman, and she comes in feeling, when she's looking at the, in the mirror, she sees all the crepey skin above her. That's all she can see. Okay. And obviously, when we look at these pictures, the before picture, it, there's a significant amount of fullness and heaviness in her skin. In the lower lid, if you'll notice, there's a little bit of a bulge that's causing that shadow. The dark circle is a shadow. Now, How old the, is that woman, by the way? She's about 48. Interesting. Okay, she okay. looks much older. So the skin over her eyes bugs her. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what do you see as a surgeon? When you look at that, what do you see? Well, I see that the brow is in a good position. It's actually in a high normal position. So there's nothing we have to do. Whenever I evaluate someone's eyelids, the first thing that I do is evaluate the position of their eyebrow because it's intimately related to the eye, what we do with the eyelid. Sometimes okay. we want to, you, can't make it, you can't even make an improvement unless you do the eyebrow. In this person, her eyebrow is great. So we focus on the eyelids. Now, look at the crepey skin, especially on the outside crepey part. Crepey meaning of, what? That's the little wrinkly skin. Yes, that's the wrinkly skin and okay. fullness in our upper lids. In fact, the wrinkliness, you can follow it all along. In this patient, we wanted to address the crepey skin in her upper lids. So we removed some of the crepey skin on the upper lids and the fat that was causing the fullness. And we also removed the fat in the lower lid that was causing the bulging. In the lower lid, we did it from behind the eyelid without even making a skin incision. Okay. Now, if you look at the after picture. Wow. Now, that doesn't even look like the same person. Well, you can see how clean it is. Basically, we try to clean things up so that it looks very natural and non-surgical afterwards. And you'll notice in the lower lid, that shadow is not there anymore. You call it a shadow. What did, you, did you add fat? Most of the time, when people have a dark shadow in the lower lid, the skin is not dark. Now, sometimes it is, but most of the time, it's because of a shadow. So it's a shadow. Yeah, and okay. it's because there's excess fat bulging out. And since most light comes from above, it hits that bulginess and it forms a shadow beneath the eye. So basically... So you didn't add fat? No, I didn't add fat and I didn't even have to take out any skin. All we did with this patient was take out a little bit of fat from behind the eyelid. But we have other pictures that show that a little bit better. Now when you say, you, we talked on the phone, when you say you have to be careful, you take too much skin, it's not good over the eye. What does that mean? Tell me about that. Because I always feel like I could spot that hollow... I think it makes people look older. Well, Randy, there's two phases of, being, of getting experience doing plastic surgery. One is to know exactly how to do the procedure. And the other part is how, exactly how much to do the procedure. All right. The most important one is how much. And I think that what we've learned is less is more, but it's, that's where the artistry comes in. I used to think that was a little bit corny when I first started in practice and I listened to other plastic surgeons talking about the artistry of cosmetic surgery. But you, you thought it was what? corny. It was that's just no joke. Really? That's no joke. There is some kind of a secret magical you to, skill you that's involved. There is an unnameable skill that's involved. It's as far as being a musician or a, uh, an artist or a painter that you can't put your finger on it, but it really makes the results much better in some people's hand than others. They could do the same procedure, but if you just take out a little bit different amount of skin or move the tissue in a different way, you can get vastly different results. The one so that, that before myself, and after, I mean, that before and after looks very natural. If I saw that after walking down the street, I wouldn't think something was done. So thank you very much. And, and by the way, I should mention, you know, Newport Beach, doctors from all over the country, they come in here for interviews. We air throughout the U.S. and Canada, mm -hmm. and they always say, you know, Newport Beach, that's where you get bad results. Well, this is fantastic results. Well, you know, Newport Beach, what it's done for me is people there are very demanding. They can go anywhere in the world and get their plastic surgery. Uh, many people can. Okay. They can go anywhere in the world. They could choose from among 40 or 50 plastic surgeons in the same building. And I'm flattered that they come to me, for, and I'm well known for eyelid surgery and eyelid reconstruction. Because um, as you can see in the next picture, which is the same patient from the side, you see that temporal overhang? We call that a temporal overhang when the skin Hangs the over the photo. outside okay. in the before. And then when you look at the after, you can see how natural that looks, and that overhang isn't there. Now, this woman was very, very happy because now she could put on makeup, she could wear eyeliner, she can just look and feel better about herself. What does she say, by the way? I mean, I'm pretty happy with the results. Ecstatic. These people are very ecstatic with a small amount of surgery. Because this is small, really, you know, but it, it does. I mean, completely different person. Let's go I mean, to the next picture. You were raised about seven years, would you say, you think? With just well, the eyes? I think that's up what to you What do you hear? What do you hear? 
Well, with what these, do they say? With these procedures, people look more relaxed. More, they feel more alert. They are more alert and they feel more alert because they no longer have to struggle to keep their eyelids open. But in this economy, though, is this one of those things that uh, people really need to do? I mean, what well, I think that in this, that? Eco- in this economy, the biggest bang for the buck in facial cosmetic surgery is eyelid surgery. Interesting. For the or, smallest or, amount or, of or surgery. Eye around the eye surgery. Right, around the eye surgery. As far as making the biggest improvement in one's appearance in the simplest and safest and fastest and most cost-effective way possible, it's eyelid surgery. Okay, but you have a bias because you're not oculoplastic surgeon. Well, I think that it's uh, well, well agreed upon that that's the, the, the case. Okay, okay. So what's this next one? I mean, this is, this is okay. incredible here. This before. Let's just show the before first. Okay, her biggest problem, if you look at her lower lids, she has dark circ- what appear to be dark circles and She shadows. stayed up all night. Well, that's actually what her main concern was. People were telling her that she looked tired all the time, and she just did not look tired. She got a good night's sleep, but because of those bags and those dark circles under the eyes, it made her look tired. Those things, when people have fullness over the eyelids, caricaturists, when, I want to, when they want to make someone look tired, what do they do? They make them look like they have saggy upper lids, particularly on the outside, okay. and they make them look like they have bags or dark circles under the eyes. If you notice that the next time yeah, you look at it. all right, all right. Okay, but hey, get, getting back to this woman, her main complaint was the lower lid where she had the darkness under the eyes. Plus, she had a lot of fullness in her upper lid, and she wasn't really able to put the makeup on there. And she was kind of feeling a little bit, she was looking a little bit tired or older than she really needed to. So with her, is it just a filler for the under the, under the eyes? Well, I think that a filler in her case would be a mistake. Because if you look very closely at that picture, okay. she has dark circle, but above that, she has a little bit of bulging. And that really is the culprit. So she doesn't really need to have the fat injected or moved. Okay. If you look at the after picture, you see just by taking out... Interesting. Is that touched up? You're touching on one of my pet peeves as far as um, before and after pictures. I strive to make all my before and after pictures the same lighting. I don't like when I see a before picture that it looks like they're in a cave, and afterwards, all of a sudden, they're out in the sunlight. <laughs> okay. So all the pictures you're going to be they're seeing all today, the same. all the pictures you're seeing because today. When, look, when we put that on the screen before and after, I mean, that is an, a, an amazing result. I mean, that's you. a beautiful... Thank you. And we got that just by taking out woman. fat from behind the eyelid, and in the upper lid, just taking out a little bit of fat and skin. Now, in her case, we did not have to do anything to the brow because her brow was in a perfect position. So you addressed the upper eyelid as yes. well? Yes. I think this is a result that most people or the majority of people can get. Her brow is not too low, it's not too high, so this is a, the most natural result that what we can get with eyelid surgery. Well, now when it's done, what does she say? Oh, she's ecstatic. She has no, you know, she's, she feels better about herself, and she certainly looks less tired. The, I, I think the main thing in her case was that she was just ecstatic about the improvement we made in her Isn't lower limb. Is there concern, by the way, that they don't want other people to know by any chance? Most people don't want anybody else to know, which brings us to recovery time. Some people ask me, well, I'm having a wedding coming up. Can I do the surgery and have time? Usually the recovery time for most of these procedures is about eight or nine days. But I usually tell people they have different recovery times. If you're going to be the mother of the bride, give yourself six to eight weeks. If you're going to be the bride, give yourself a little bit longer. But at most working people, if they take off a week, or some, some What about me? Can I be back in a week? It might I wear take, a lot of makeup. Remember that. No, uh-huh. I'm kidding. It may take five or six months in you. <laughs> okay. I'm only kidding. Okay, okay. So, uh, so but downtime, you know, can be uh, uh, short. Yes. Well, in other words, if this person only had the fat underneath her eyelids, sometimes you can get back to work in a few days. Okay, good. Okay, good. In fact, with a pair of sunglasses, you can go shopping on the second day and nobody would know that you had anything done. Okay, good. So before and after photos, do you mm-hmm. think the patients, do you think it's fair that, you know, a patient goes to you and you're only going to show them your best photos? I mean, these are your best photos, right? No, these are not my best photos. If you want me to come, um, next time I'm going to bring my best photos. These are your worst photos. photos. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but you, because you're big on lighting, you know, don't, you know, be, should, the, should the person that watches this, and this will be played on my website, but when you're looking at before and after photos, what should you look for? Well, I think there's a lot of subtle ways with photography to manipulate people's impressions of the results. Okay. And some of them are a little bit subtle. I know that some laser companies who come to sell me lasers, the before after, if you look at them carefully, the before pictures, they could be, just by, you know, with all the lights in here, all you need to do is move one light a certain way or drop this light out on the before picture and put the light on the after picture. 
I have a lecture that I show a before and after picture, a, a plastic surgery lecture okay. for eyelid surgery. And I show a before and after picture. But you know what? It's before and after flash photography. And people in the room would think they would swear it was before and after actual surgery. It looked so dramatic. It was, I just did that to show people how um, the, their impressions can be, their impression of. So the when they go to your website, when they look at your website. These are real results. The before and the after. I should mention this too. We were over at my green screen. Uh, this was a couple weeks ago. And, uh, and, and I said to you, I said, uh, you know, if you're going to light the before, may, you know, use natural lighting and then use the nice soft boxes uh, on the after. Uh, you said, no, I don't like uh, to do that. No, That's I, good for you. Good I for see you. that too many times. It's kind of my pet peeve. That's your pet peeve. You know, they have medication for that if it bothers you <laughs> that much. But uh, when I read the newspaper sometimes with these advertisements, I think that you, well, we all know that what we see is the, the horrible looking shady before and after picture. And afterwards, it could be that result could just be lighting. Okay, now this is kind of like our uncut part of our website. Okay, uh -huh. but you know, when people go to spas or they go to you know estheticians or they go to you know cosmetic guys or so-called cosmetic guys, everybody's saying add volume, add volume, and a lot of these you remove fat. You, you know, add it really, fat. there's no. It's easy to make a sound bite. You know how it is with news nowadays. Everyone's a sound bite. But the truth is. We have trends and we have different things we can do in plastic surgery, but when a person comes in to see me, everybody's an individual. And some people need, like particularly in the lower lid, some people need the fat moved into a groove they have. Okay. Other people don't have that groove. So there's no one size fits all. It's really very individualized. Let me see that, but hand me that for just a second, because I want to make this point. Okay, so this photo right here. Now, you know, I sometimes secretly like to think that I could diagnose people and, and I could tell them what they need, right? Mm -hmm. This is a secret thing of mine. I would say that person just needs to add volume. No. And, and in fact, that wasn't the problem. No. You're saying that it was a, sh in this after, there's no laser, No, in, the, in this person, no, there isn't. In this person, it would be a mistake to add volume because what I find is, and I see this from other people, a lot of um, other specialties send their problem or more difficult cases to oculoplastic surgeons like myself. Okay. And what I see a lot of the time is, um, there's a little bit too much being volume being added. I mean, in all this, in all this. Uh, well, the profile looks funny, by the way. I could spot that too. They're built out too far. The problem is that you're trying to make the mat you're trying to make the, the most natural looking contour. And if you're trying to, by putting in volume, whether it's with fat or with Juvederm or filler, if you're trying to match an abnormal curve, then the whole thing's going to look abnormal. You're going to, it'll look good up close, and you, you you sit back, and then you see it doesn't look normal. So okay. everything's individual. And do you think people, everybody, if they have eye, you know, in and around the eyes, they should see an oculoplastic plastic surgeon? Well, I would recommend that to my friends and my family, yes. You like that? You went through a two-year fellowship. Well, it's a one-year fellowship. One year? But I've okay. been practicing for about 26 years. 26 years. And so this was done by just... In the lower lid, it was just done by taking out the fat. Same lighting. She was thrilled? Yes. She loves that? She's pretty happy with now it. Now she's yeah. happy? Yeah. And this thing lasts. Usually when you take out fat, it's permanent. Not always, but about 95% of the time. Okay, what, what drives you nuts about what's going on in and around the eyes right now in the industry? Anything that bothers you? I don't think anything is driving me particularly crazy. I think for a while, um, uh, I think over-promising results is, it doesn't drive me crazy, but it's something that I see. I think that when people come to my office, I like them to have realistic expectations. Oh, I, I'll tell you one thing, it doesn't drive me nuts, but when a person comes to my office, I spend a lot of time with the patient and I end up giving them Two or three alternatives. You could here. You could do this, or maybe if you had a little bit more in your budget, you can do this. Or if you had a little bit more risk, you, you were willing to tolerate a little bit more risk, you can do this. Risk meaning kind of, downtime? Are you talking well, about? risk of the operation? Any operation you oh, do interesting, has risk. Interesting. So if you do less, there's less risk. And I like to put it in perspective for people because not everybody. That that that's. I like to make people happy. I don't like to do as much surgery on one person that I can. I like to make them happy. And what I find from people coming to me from other surgeons sometimes, they will um, say, oh, I went to this doctor's office, and he says, oh, that's what you need, and that's it. Well, it's not quite that, that way. There's lots of different things that are going to be done, and they all have different risk profiles and different benefits. So you kind of give people like the good, better, best presentation I where they I like to do that options. because that's what I'd like done for me. If I went Because I went into a guy, and I told you, he told me I needed a facelift. I did too. I was told I needed a facelift also. Do I, where's the camera? You need a facelift, need a facelift? <laughs> Is that right? But, but see, and, and I think sometimes you have to look for a doctor that has an eye for beauty. Look at their staff. Look, you know, with you, I, I have to mention this. It's a personal thing about you. I think you've been married almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. I saw your wife. 
a natural beauty. Well, thank you very much. I don't know if she... She'll uh, be happy to hear that, too. She doesn't have big, giant lips. Runs. She doesn't have a tight face and uh, just, just like a natural beauty. Well, thank you very so much. So it makes me think, you know, okay, the guy probably has an eye for this. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. So now your other photos, and we're going to take a quick break. Okay. Good stuff, by the way. It's very, very good photos. Okay. So in the before picture, she was concerned about the fullness that she has in her upper lid. And in the, if you'll it's notice. It's like she has no upper lid at all. Well, you like. know, I remember her very well. And when I explain things to patients, I give them options. And I help them make a decision, an informed decision. Now, in her particular case, she had lower eyebrows, and she also had a lot of fullness on the upper lid, fullness and extra skin and fat. If you look at her lower lid, you see she had a lot of bulginess that was causing a shadow. In her lower lid, there's not much of a question about how to make the improvement. I removed the fat from behind the eyelid without making a skin incision. Okay. If you look at her upper lid, she has an option to either raise the brow or make the improvement through the eyelid. You think brows are being overdone? I think they're being a bit overdone. Brow lifts, too many brow yes. lifts out there. I think that you could make about 20% more of an improvement from the brow in most cases, but the majority of the improvement, as you can see in this after picture, is from the is eyelid very surgery nice, itself. Very nice. You see, that even with a person with a low brow, doesn't need to get necessarily need to get a brow lift to make a very nice natural improvement. Okay. And you can see again, if you look at her lower lids, the shadow is gone. So she looked a lot more awake and alert. She was very happy about the way that she looked after surgery because of a very natural re improvement. Here's another patient. Okay. And if you look at her, what we did with her was... She looks a, angry on the before. And the reason she looks a little bit angry is because the brows are tilted downward in the middle. And okay. I remember her quite well. On the day of the preoperative exam, we decided to change our technique. Initially, she just wanted to do the upper lids. But when we... The skin. When you say upper lids, we're talking about the skin. Okay. Yeah, the upper lid surgery. But when we went over the options, we decided to do the brow lift also. As you can see from the after picture, her brow is just in a much more relaxed and neutral position. So nice. it, it, it gave us the ability to um, give a very natural result for the upper lid surgery. It's prettier in the after. She jumped up she the first... thinner, by the way. She, she Actually, she does. She jumped up afterwards and gave me a big hug on the first day because we decided to do that brow lift. Now, why did you compare me? We were looking over at the, at, on uh, the green room on this, and you compared me to this is my problem. Well, you what know, do you mean by that? Well, your eyebrows are just a little bit, when the eyebrows are a little bit droopier in the center. In the center, right Again, here. getting back to a caricaturist or a cartoonist, when they want to make look, somebody look angry or concerned or harsh, they bring somebody's eyebrows in so they're, they're angling down. And even though it's very subtle. So in the before picture In her there, before picture, it's a little bit subtle. So but you're just you, picking up just the center? Or we're just, well, we're lifting it all over, but mostly in the center in her case. Okay, interesting. You know, when you look at the after, a lot of people are very concerned about looking too surprised after a brow lift. Yeah, I don't like brow lifts. I told you. I'm not a surgeon, but mm -hmm. I feel like I could spot them. It's too high. Well, as you can see from this after picture, it's very natural. Yeah, yeah. This no, is taken about one month after surgery, and she was just ecstatic with her result, and that stays that way for a long time. Okay, here's another patient, and you can see how an improvement can be made without lifting the brow. Again, in, in this person's case, if you look at the upper lid where there's all that overhang and fullness, I took out the fullness, and we didn't even change the eyebrow position, but if you look at the after picture, look Very at, nice. what do you think? Yeah, no, she looks younger, rested. Mm -hmm. And then and, we... Uh, what about under the eye? In really? her case, I took out a little bit of fat underneath the eyelid, almost as an afterthought. But you know what? It made a, a bigger improvement. It looks even better in person than it does in the picture. Okay, one more photo and we're going to a break. This is dramatic, by the way. Okay. Now, this is a picture of a person with nobody would argue that the first and, and most obvious feature about her face was her full eyelids. And if you look at the after picture, it's like night and day. Very nice. It's very nice. And this is... Uh, this is somebody that comes in and, and no brow lift in this particular case. No, that's not necessary in her case. Her brows are in a great position. Okay, good. We're going to take a quick break. We come back, more of these photos, okay? okay? And more about the process, what people can expect on day one. You're watching The Wellness Hour, leader in medical news and information. I'm Randy Alvarez. We're talking about what you can do for your aging eyes. We'll be right back. Surgery was easy. I was awake. Um, we were talking. We were laughing. There is no pain at all. We listened to Stevie Wonder. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> From the first week I got back to work, they're like, oh my goodness, Lucy, what have you done? You look great. I had comments all the way from the people who knew that I had it done. Um, 
telling me that my eyes look fabulous, saying, uh -huh. you know, gee, you just look a little bit better. Oh, you look well rested. Wow, you look like the woman I married, you know, 20 plus years ago. You still look great. So now all of a sudden I'm getting more chairs pulled out for me. I'm getting a lot of attention and it's wonderful. You're watching The Wellness Hour, the leader in medical news and information. I'm Randy Alvarez. Today's topic, the aging face, specifically in and around the eyes. What can be done? What are the new breakthroughs with us? We have an expert on the topic, oculoplastic surgeon from Newport Beach, Dr. Weiss. Okay. Uh, and for people just tuning in, I mean, this is all you do. I mean, you've restricted your practice. Yes. Uh, I have a passion for this. To just the eyes. You know, the techniques that I use are brow lifts, upper eyelid surgery, lower eyelid surgery, laser skin resurfacing, Botox. Procedures like that, uh, that affect the area of the face around the eye. And you're a perfectionist. You're going for perfection, you say. Well, it's a rejuvenate. Most right? of what I do is rejuvenating surgery. It's making people look younger and more relaxed. Okay. Now, we looked at a lot of photos. These are yes. all on your website. Is that mm -hmm. right? They can yes. look there. Um, Asians. You have a picture of some... Uh, Very challenging. Asians. And I'd like to show you one of the cases that I t take the most satisfaction from. Okay. This is a woman that felt very self-conscious about not having an eyelid crease on one side. If you look at her right upper look lid, at pretty you look eyes. at her right upper lid, you'll notice she doesn't have an eyelid crease. In the left upper lid she does, in the right upper lid she doesn't. It's very subtle, I interesting. Now that's a very challenging case. Well, what I did was, if you look at the after picture, now you look at the pictures and the right eyelid matches the left eyelid. I'm surprised she would even notice that. Well, she was terribly self-conscious and Asians have a different problem than we do their eyelid crease is very important. As a matter of fact, as I mentioned, this is the mo one that gives me the most satisfaction because it actually took the most surgical skill. But if you look at the next patient, the next patient is also an Asian. He's an Asian man, and he has no eyelid crease at all. Okay. And in the lower lid, you'll notice there's a little bit of fullness. But if you look at the upper lid, the skin is actually hanging over his lashes. It's just resting on his lashes. All right, and by the way, as far as the Asian community, do you see a lot of this coming in, people that well, don't Well, being like in Orange that. County, I do see a lot of you Asian do? eyes. You I'm okay. somewhat of an Asian eyelid specialist. As a matter of fact, when somebody wants to have eyelid creases formed, they come to an oculoplastic, oculoplastic surgeon such surgery. as myself. As a matter of fact, you'll, as you'll see in this next picture, this is the man after surgery. Very nice. No, it's very, the, the reason I like this picture, and the, the patient was happy with this picture, is because it was very natural. The biggest fear that people have, again, before eyelid surgery is that it will look unnatural. So well, I Well, that would definitely my, be my fear. I pride myself on creating natural appearing patients. Now, now with men, because, you know, we talked over there, and everybody, mm -hmm. you know, I always ask questions for myself sometimes. But you said, what's your biggest fear? And I said, I don't want to look, you know, feminine or unnatural. And so I guess that's in the hands of the surgeon. That is. And in a man, the biggest concern as a surgeon is you really want to be very subtle and conservative. Because a man's eyes don't need to look like a woman's eyes. If you take out too much tissue, you can make an, a man's eyes look more feminine. So that's the major thing that you want to do. In the lower eyelid, we just want to normalize the contour. I usually put it to a man when they come into my office. In a man, we want to take away a negative. If a person has a lot of overhang or a lot of droopiness in their eyelid, we want to take away that negative. We don't want the, patient, the, the man walking into a room and everybody saying, hey, what beautiful eyes. On the other hand, on a woman, they appreciate that. So we could be a little bit more aggressive at taking out some skin because they like to put on makeup. In a man, they don't want makeup. So all we want to do is take away the negative. A man wants to go forward and from a week after surgery, they don't want anybody in the world to know. As a matter of fact, a lot of my male friends that I've done surgery on, I don't even give it another thought. You would think that I would know who I did surgery on, but I don't. Really? Yeah. Really? Now, I know it can make a big difference only because I've seen this photo coming up right there. Or maybe it's not coming up. I'm making it come up. This guy right here. Okay. Oh, that's okay. a dramatic. Let's take, let's take a look at this picture right now. Unbelievable. Okay. Well, this picture is, is typical of upper eyelid hooding. Okay. There was a lot of skin and fat on this man's eyelid. And that's kind of typical. There's a lot of people walking around who have eyelids like this. It's not that much more difficult to create a nice improvement than just taking out a little bit. And if so with at, him, what would you do? If you look at the after picture, if you look at the upper lid, I took out the upper lid, and this is all done under local anesthesia. He didn't have to go to sleep for this. I took out the upper lid skin and some fullness, that was, uh, some fat that was causing the fullness. And afterwards, you can see, he looked, well, what do you think? He looks very symmetric. Well, it looks very natural. Nice. Well, he looks younger and rested. You know, one of the things I told you, and you go, I don't know if I would say that. I said, if, if these two guys, same education, same everything else, applied for a job, 
Everything's the same. All things are equal. Who do you hire? You hire the person who looks like they have a lot more energy. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. Okay. I believe that this man came into me, he was in the job market, and he was a little bit older, and he had to compete with younger people. And this is common, uh, a common type of patient that I have. Somebody coming in, and they actually want to still work, and they have to compete with the job market. Obviously, well, he looks the patient tired, looks the a lot There's more no alert. About it. Well, if he's in a business meeting, he's, if you look at the after picture, you're going to think he's listening to what you're saying. If you look at the before picture, you might want to give him a nudge to keep him awake. Interesting, interesting. Are more men coming in for this? I mean, it's still mostly women? It's about 65% women, I would say. And, and what are the age ranges, by the way, you see? You know, it varies because a lot of the, these problems are congenital. I mean, they've just had it they're in their DNA. So there was one of the pictures in here that we've already looked at. The, the lady was like this in her teens, and she just had a lot of fullness. People have that. So some people come in in their 20s, and some people come in in their 70s. There's a wide variation in the time. So if your, eyes don't bo- if your eyes bother you, do something about it. I think the main point to get across is that it's an easy thing. It's a relatively easy thing to But go to a specialist. I mean, look, all of our shows, we also try to educate, because this is a real interview here. Um, you know, it's not scripted, but... You have a, I mean, go to an oculoplastic surgeon if you're well, going to have eye surgery. I mean, is that your feeling? People ask me about oculoplastic surgery, and I make an analogy. If somebody has a, a heart palpitation, you can go to your general doctor and your internist, and they'll kind of take care of you. But if you have a cardiologist, you're going to go to your cardiologist. Or if you live in, a, in an urban area, the same thing with oculoplastic surgery. Lots of different plastic surgeons who operate on breasts and bellies and everywhere else in the body also do eyelids. But... I just do eyelids, so I think that... You have an advantage. I think that I have a lot of experience around the eyes. Okay, good. We have time for probably just a couple of more. Okay, well, what this is got? a good picture that shows how easy it is to make an improvement in the lower lid. Just by taking out a little bit of fat. You see this man? Yeah. Okay, now if you look at his before picture, there's a big shadow underneath his eyelid. All I did was take out the fat from behind the eyelid, and his recovery time was just a matter of days. There were no incisions made in his skin at all. Interesting. And by the way, you know, just to cut it, because I'm being brainwashed like everybody else, because you always hear add volume, add volume, add volume to the face. Uh, but this looks like you're adding volume. No. But you're eliminating the shadow. Well, I think something. there is a place for adding volume, but it has to be done judiciously. Okay. There are some conditions where people have a groove between their eyelid and their nose, and it's definitely preferable to maybe we have a new procedure, a relatively new procedure, where we transpose the fat into that area. Okay. The, the, the real goal, Randy, is to create the best contour and the most natural looking contour between your eyelash, your lower eyelash, down onto the cheek. I think that you can see this in the next picture. You see this woman here. You see the big shadow that she has just from the bulge. And we made that improvement, I made that improvement just by taking out a little fat from behind his eye, her eyelid. Randy, you but, know, I have three more pictures that I think are okay, really important. Okay, Can I show okay. those? About a minute. Okay. You see this picture? Here's a woman that we did her upper lids, like with the ones we did before. But in the lower lid, we made that improvement by taking out the fat and also tightening the eyelid. Because if you get older, it needs to be tightened. And that's a special technique that's done that's among oculoplastic surgeons that um, makes the operation much more safe. Very nice. This Very next nice. picture here, guess what was done in this picture? Uh... Same procedure. Well, no, this was a different procedure. And look at the lower eyelids only. And the lower eyelids in this woman, all that crepiness was taken away with laser skin resurfacing with the CO2 laser. So underneath the eyes, just laser. And, that's, and you did the laser. That, yes, and that's commonly a procedure that I like. I became an expert with the CO2 laser when I was on the staff at Beckman Laser Institute in 1996. And it is because it's the best and most accurate way of improving the wrinkles in the area around the eye and the upper cheek. And that in this woman, all we did was use a laser. We didn't do any cutting surgery at all. And for our last picture, I want to show people the fact that sometimes people come in and they want insurance to cover their procedure. Well, this yeah, is the type of question. This is the type of procedure that insurance covers. This is a woman who has true ptosis. That's spelled with a P. P T O S I S, and she could barely see out of her eyes in the before picture. Is that right? That's and how... that's the eye level. That's wow. when we raise the eye level. And again, that's a special oculoplastic technique. Okay, good. I want to thank you for coming to the show. By the way, a lot of stuff to cover. And, and by the way, if you're watching this, we have a long version. Uh, we call it the you know uncut version on uh, on our website at wellnesshour.com. All you have to do is look under Dr. Weiss, and you'll be able to see that. You'll also have the long version on your website if you like. But uh, you know, a lot of things you know to mention. You've got a charity. You're involved in uh, some patents. You're a science guy. A lot of research. 
Any, anything you want to mention on that before we go? Well, I was just issued a patent on a method to make Botox injections less painful or painless. Okay. And I was just issued a U.S. patent. I did a study that proved that it created less discomfort for patients. So that's one thing I'm very proud of. We're out of time. I want to thank you for coming on the show. Very good stuff. So all of these photos are on your website. Yes, they are. And uh, consultations? consultations? They all meet with you? The cosmetic consultations are private consultations, and they all meet with me. They're complimentary. Okay, good. And uh, if they want to find out about your uh, charity? Go to One World Sight Project, endblindness.org, and you'll find out about how to cure blindness around the world, how we're curing blindness around the world. You're committed to this. I mean, I mean this is, uh, this is uh, one of your passions. Well, I was inspired to start this charity by a song that I wrote about blind people. And it just, one thing led to another, and it made me start this charity. You're a jazz many musician. Years ago. Yes, yes, I am. And I think that that's uh, the improvisation with jazz helped me in oculoplastic surgery. How so? You have, How so? Of, you have to do a lot of thinking on your feet. You don't always know exactly what cuts you're going to make when, until you get into surgery. So it's a lot of Is thinking right? on your feet. It's the same kind of skill. So your patents with Botox, tell me about this. I mean, you're a science guy. Whatever I get interested in, I sort of get interested in a big way. And because I'm a perfectionist, we talked about this before, I try to think of how I can make things better. Now, I've been injecting Botox since 1989 as an oculoplastic surgeon. Because before, way before it was injected in, um, among old plastic surgeons and it became a household word, it was just used in oculoplastic surgery. For what? For blepharospasm and facial spasm. Okay. So those are the people that I was initially injecting in 1989. And then we started to notice that people look better and took away some of the wrinkles and it made them more relaxed looking. So I've been injecting Botox for a long time. And one of the things, it's not very, there's not a lot of discomfort. But in some patients... I get it, by the way. It's very painful. In, no, it's in, terrible. In some patients, there's a lot of anxiety about any injections. And of course, we always want to make things less comfort, you know, less less discomfort. So I came up with a way of a process for um, and, and a procedure for administering Botox that is almost completely painless. And after I did a study on that, really, and we, proved, we proved that it decreased people's anxiety and it markedly statistically decreased their perception of pain. And I was just issued a patent for that, I'm happy to say. Is that right? After many years, it was just issued a few weeks ago. Is it a special needle? What is it, a solution? Well, yeah, we call it the Weiss Comfort Shield. It's a way of administering a, a numbing spray to protect the eye from the other effects, uh, the eye and the face from the, other, from the overspray from the numbing. Interesting, interesting. So it's not available at the present time, but it soon will be, I hope. So these are the outtakes. I, you know, there's a lot of things about you that that uh, you know we couldn't put on our regular show, but let's talk a little bit about your charity for a moment, and then I want to talk a little bit about you as a science guy with your patents and some mm -hmm. of the things you do. Mm -hmm. So tell me about your charity. Well, you know, the charity, the only thing I could say, Randy, is I was inspired, and it's my passion. And not only that, I'm pretty much fixated on this. It's become part of my life. Everything that I do in my life, I relate to this charity or think about how what it can it? be related. It? It's called the One World Sight Project. And the basic point of the charity is there are 25 million people that are blind in the world needlessly from cataracts, and they could be cured in about 15 minutes for $50 a piece. Really? So, in other words, we just, we just held a, char a charitable event that we cured over 200 people of blindness in a few hours. From the money we raised in a few hours, in addition to buying a retinal camera, we Cure, we actually cured people of blindness, and that's fascinating to me. So for a $50, like a donation... Permanently cured them of blindness. They're cured of blindness. And, and are these older people? And, and where are you doing the surgeries, by the way? Well, Who's the, getting these surgeries? You know, it's mostly not in the United States. There are more ophthalmologists in the San Francisco Bay Area than they are in the entire continent of Africa. So basically, where we're, where we're, we've, we've done a lot of work in... Um, some work in India and Nepal, but lately we've been concentrating our efforts in Africa and specifically Tanzania. Okay. And we've um, raised enough money a few years ago to, for the completion of the first comprehensive community eye care center in the whole continent of Africa. So what we've funded is and supported is unique in the whole continent. We'd like to spread that model throughout the continent. One of our pilot projects that we're trying to get funding for is to um, fund replicated eye care centers that can, and a system of doing eyelids, eye, eye, not eyelid, but 
cataract surgery that can be spread and change the and improve the eye care throughout Africa. So th this is for the older patient. Well, cataract occurs at a much younger age in, in Africa. In these other areas, like, in like many what average, age? In, in many in the fifties, it's not really? uncommon to have cataracts in your fifties because people who live around the equator get and, and in certain populations for some reason they get cataracts earlier. So. There are some el more elderly people, but whenever anybody gets a cataract in a developing nation, it takes not only them out of production, but someone else who has to lead them around. We, also take, okay. care of, we also take care of um, pediatric kids who have cataracts. Uh, a, another thing, it's easy to explain cataract surgery to people. There are 25 million people who can be cured in 15 minutes with a $50 operation. That's the takeaway that people Is should that remember. Right? But really, to get this thing to pass muster with all the eye care organizations in the world, including the World Health Organization. Um, I had to go around and talk to all these people and be serious about doing this. And we're not only doing cataract surgery, we're improving eye care because we have to look at things, the resources are limited. So we have to really improve the total picture. But the most dramatic thing to remember is there are 25 million people who are blind needlessly in the world. And for $50, they could see again. Okay, so we're going to put the website where they could donate the $50 okay. to save somebody's vision at the bottom. What is it? It's endblindness.org. And that's your chair. End blindness. And I spoke to this, um, I spoke about this. Uh, Nelson Mandela is a supporter. He personally told me that he supported this project. Stevie Wonder is one of uh, my special advisors to this project. Okay. So there's a lot of um, good energy behind what we're doing. I want to thank you for coming to the show. Very oh, good. Thanks for inviting Excellent me. Excellent stuff. You know, watch the Wellness Hour, leader in medical news and information. I'm Randy Alvarez. If you would like to see this interview again, you can go online at thewellnesshour.com. In fact, if you want to see the long version of this, it talks a little bit more about his background and training, uh, his charity. I guess you have patents as well. A lot of things we didn't talk about. We'll have to yeah, have the back. painless Botox patent. Did we talk about that? Pain, no, we didn't. Painless Botox patent. So we'll put that on the outtakes. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, very interesting. And if you don't like the way you're aging, you may want to, especially around the eyes, uh, you, you may want to take a look, uh, go to his website and uh, find out more about Dr. Weiss. For now, I wish you good help. Thanks for watching The Wellness Hour, the leader in medical news with your host, Randy Alvarez, the authority on health issues.